The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever, the show that looks at the intersection of mental health and work and how we can all do both better. In 2021 alone, there were over 40 million prescriptions for Adderall dispensed in the U.S. That's according to the health research firm IQVIA. Frequently used to treat ADHD, the demand for stimulants like Adderall and Ritalin has increased in recent years, which is why, in part, we're now facing a shortage of the medication in many parts of the country. And like many other medications, these drugs are important to helping people live their lives and get their work done and succeed in their careers. The shortage has detrimental effects for many. And it's also brought to light a number of issues in our healthcare system, from misdiagnosis to the cost of prescription drugs. In a bit, we'll hear from Lindsay Scola, a writer and speaker who depends on her stimulant prescription to treat her narcolepsy. You know, I, I'm I'm grateful to narcolepsy in the way that it's really gotten me to focus on myself and how I sort of live intentionally for what's going to be best for me. And so, you know, this the last couple of years, it's been, how do I continue to have something that I work from home so I can nap when I need to and make sure that I'm doing things in, in the way that's best for my body. But first, a little bit more about how we got here, how big the problem is, and what it means for many people in their careers. Jeannie Pinder is a former New York Times reporter who is now founder and CEO of clearhealthcosts.com. She's an expert on the healthcare system and how people get their medications. I spoke with her about what's causing the stimulant shortage and what it's unveiling about our healthcare system. We've been hearing about this problem for several months and had increasingly noticed that it was becoming a more and more widespread. It's a terrible problem for people who have need of this kind of medication, people with ADHD, people with narcolepsy, who cannot function if they're not medicated. And all of the factors that go into this include things like there is a certain stigma attached to this kind of medication, partly because it's misinterpreted in many cases, as something that's sort of a nice to have and not a need to have. Mm. You'll find patients who have family members, employers, friends who will be like, not really sure about the ADHD diagnosis, for example. I live in a suburb of New York City where sometimes high achieving parents are said to seek diagnoses for children that may cast askance on this idea that people really cannot function properly without medications. Where parents are, are accused of going out and seeking diagnoses, when in point of actual fact, ADHD, narcolepsy, and other things like that are what you might call invisible disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with siblings who are blind um, and one sibling who had polio. He wears a brace. She walks with a white cane. Hmm. Those are visible disabilities, but there are invisible disabilities like ADHD, narcolepsy, anxiety, depression, things that are not so easy to see. Why haven't I seen this story all over the media? A lot of people take these drugs. You know, that's a really good question. Lindsay pointed out that she'd seen a mainstream media story about it that sort of suggests that medication for ADHD is kind of a lifestyle choice. Mm. It may partly be because 
I'm 68 years old. ADHD was not a diagnosis that was present in my kindergarten class. Now it's diagnosed more. It's widely accepted, completely understood as a diagnosis. But and maybe for lots of people, this is not something that's part of their everyday lives or, or their childhood or their youth. I think also, and you know, I am very familiar with ADHD, let me just say, there is a sense, people get very up in arms about it. They like to use it as a symbol of everything that's wrong in our society and mm -hmm. kids declining attention spans and over medication and our failure as parents, you know, like yeah. it, it's such a simple ADHD. And I, I have to believe that that colors the coverage and the response to this stimulus. Like, like if there was a shortage of statins, we would not be in this boat. <laughs> You're so right. You are so right. And I don't know what the answer is other than to be open about it and to do what we did, which is to write about it and to sort of shine a spotlight on this thing. Imagine people who are unmedicated and who are spending hours, days on the phone trying to find this medication without which they cannot function. I, I can't imagine. So you write in your fabulous blog on clearhealthcost.com, which is your company, which we can talk about in a little bit, that the initial Adderall shortage, which began last year, is partly demand-driven and partly a manufacturing problem. Can you dive into what you've learned about that? Yeah. So one of the things that happened recently is that more and more people are diagnosed with ADHD, perhaps as a matter of you know public consciousness about the fact that this is actually a real condition with a real treatment. And uh, also partly perhaps as a result of the fact that people who were in the pandemic working from home and realizing that all of a sudden their work habits maybe suggested that there was something else going on, mm. managed to get maybe a telemedicine appointment because telemedicine rose during the pandemic. Incidentally, it's hard to get a doctor's appointment these days. It's really hard. It is really hard. A psychiatrist appointment is even harder. And I, I have heard. And so if people are getting the proper diagnosis and then getting the proper medication, that, of course, increases demand for this medication or this group of medications. Mm -hmm. And you could see how I think the numbers that we were quoted had something to do with like prescriptions for Adderall rising more than 30 percent in the last five years and accelerating during the pandemic, according to a Washington Post story. Nearly 40% of all prescriptions for stimulants last year came via telemedicine. Mm. So you have an increase in demand. And then you also have, we're all familiar with various kinds of supply chain shortages everywhere across the economy. Cat food, um, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever. Well, the baby formula fiasco, right? That baby formula. I went to my grocery store one day and there was no sour cream. Like, I, I don't know what happened to the sour cream supply chain, but <laughs> we all know that the supply chain has been screwed up by the pandemic, by shipping, manufacturing. So there's an element of that, too, that we think goes into the shortage. And then that initial Adderall shortage was compounded by this strange settlement on an opioid case with three major distributors of medications throughout the United States. And that settlement, which came into effect last July, affected deliveries of medications to all sorts of pharmacies, chain drugstores, individual drugstores. And the thing has been like working its way through the economy off and on since last July. And that, I think, is the thing that has really pushed it over the edge in the last um, two or three months. And is that because a lot of these stimulants in particular are scheduled to controlled substances? Right. So the, the opioid settlement was supposed to limit distribution of opioids. We all know that opioids are a scourge on society. But what it did, actually, this court case 
made limits on pharmacies orders of all kinds of controlled substances Adderall, Xanax, um, Ritalin, all sorts of things. So it's not just the opioids, which was the thing that was supposed to be limited. Compounding the problem is that the way this settlement was put into effect is the limits are apparently secret. Hmm. They have to do with some sort of proportional representation of how many non-controlled substances a drugstore is delivering versus how many controlled substances. Wow. So it's all kinds of controlled substances. Schedule two, like, like I said, Adderall, Xanax, Ritalin, all sorts of things. So the FDA was well-meaning, probably. Right. But the effects reach around. Right. Exactly. And I think that because it's a sort of a slow moving problem that hasn't really been publicized that well, apparently the FDA and the regulators are now aware of it. We did speak with Julie over at Project Sleep, which is a nonprofit that advocates for sleep disorders. And she said that regulators are now aware of this problem. But it's not clear to me that that means that they can address it in a timely fashion so that people like our friend Lindsay and all the other people that I talked to for this story will get relief anytime soon. What does this situation tell you about the state, I guess, of psychiatric medication in this country, but more largely about access to medication for things that aren't deemed life-saving? That's a really good question. So there are a couple of big issues in there. As you know, our healthcare system imposes this weird divide between physical health and mental health, yeah. which is in no way borne out by science. But that is the way our society treats mental health, behavioral health. It started out with the Mental Health Parity Act in 1996 and then was further modified and bolstered, including by the Affordable Care Act, that you shouldn't treat mental health and physical health as two completely separate things. However, our healthcare system still does treat them that way. Even though there are laws in place that uh, forbid that, our healthcare system does that. And the end result of that basically is that it's, as you mentioned, very hard to get a psychiatrist appointment. Mm -hmm. Much of therapy turns out not to be covered by insurance policies or covered in name only, where the insurer will say, oh, of course we have therapists. We have one appointment in December. It's 300 miles away from you. Would you (laughs) like that one? So essentially, you have a system that's running on cash, which means that if you can afford it, you can get it. But if you can't, you don't. Right. That's not good. You know, it's so interesting, the threads between all the different kinds of treatment. You know, I am eternally shocked at how discombobulated our system is for mental health and mental illness. And, you know, I'm I'm someone with a lot of privilege and a lot of access and a good network. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I have been in crisis for myself or my kids, the amount of sort of dialing and praying that you have to do to find providers, to find medicines, to find appointments, Mm -hmm. is shocking in this day and age, in this country, when I can order something on Amazon in less time than it takes for me to blink. What are the incentives around that? Like, what is not profitable or working about the mental health care system that makes it so janky and old-fashioned? Nothing in our health care system really works right now. Mm. But no, like if I go to my primary care, it's affiliated with a large hospital system. She orders me an x-ray. I go up to x-ray. It's done. Mm -hmm. Like if you have good insurance, that works. Right. Yeah, that does work better than than mental health. I mean, mental health, I just think it's sort of, it was built into the system from a very long time ago, this sort of pre-industrial or agricultural era idea that you know, if you're having struggles, you should just pull up your socks and <laughs> do it. And that the healthcare system is designed to deliver x-rays and 
fix broken bones and not necessarily to address mental health. Yeah. And that is still something that is reflected to this day in our society. Does insurance pay out less for behavioral and mental health? Yes. Huh. Therapists continually complain that they just don't get enough money from insurance companies to make it worth their while. Yeah. And you will find as a result of this that a lot of therapists do not take insurance. It's a cash system right now to the point where, for example, if you wanted to know what a visit to a primary care provider would cost you on insurance, you wouldn't be able to find that out. But you can find out how much most therapists charge if you go to Psychology Today, because the Psychology Today listings have providers' rates listed on their pages on the website. Right. It's a cash economy. I have another question, actually. I don't know how much you know about this, but how have you seen the growth of large therapy-focused telehealth startups like Lyra Health or Modern Health affect the economy of therapy and behavioral health? It, that's also a really great question. I mean, if you look at better help, mm -hmm. which sort of became a colossus striding the, the landscape with contracts with all sorts of employers and also individuals, then you have other companies like Cerebral, a mental health app that has come under extreme criticism for having poorly qualified providers for huge layoffs, oh. for sharing users' data with tech giants. Oh, my. And they are really struggling right now. So I think, you know, when you look at that sort of telemental health sector, you have to look at the differences between and among the providers. But it's definitely something that has become much more important as any kind of telehealth has during the pandemic. People just don't want to go to the doctor's office that much. I also think it's amazing, though, because, I mean, I know Lyra Health has has really high quality providers. And when your company buys a subscription, I mean, theoretically, that will improve the old having to go onto your insurance company website and search through endless in-network therapists. Right. You know, again, that investment of time that patients right. are asked to do. So, so I would imagine it's actually been a real sort of boon for giving people access if they're lucky enough to work for someone who can get them a subscription or they can have a subscription. Absolutely. So coming back to the stimulant shortage, do you have any advice for people listening who are having a hard time getting the medicine they need? The thing that I heard most from people was just keep asking over and over and over again. Mm. We heard from people who did things like when they were calling the phone tree at the drugstore instead of they they would click through and say that they were a prescriber rather than a patient. So I that do they, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, possibility that you might be able to get a different medication. We had a list of things down at the bottom of the blog post that had suggestions from places like Reddit had a very handy page. Mm -hmm. It's r slash ADHD, by the way. Yes, r slash ADHD. We do not give medical advice, but there are a number of things that you can do, like talk to your doctor, see if there's another medication. Can you split pills, like get a 10, 10 mg pill, split it to five? Mm -hmm. We heard a lot of people who said things like they had better luck at a small pharmacy than they did at a chain like CVS. Mm. I have one more question for you. In my experience and a lot of other people I know, when you are trying to find a treatment, a medicine for one of these invisible illnesses, sometimes visible ones, but especially for mental health, it's a lot of trial and error. You have to try a lot of drugs often. Yeah. And I've also had the experience of having to sort of like fail or claim that certain drugs, I've tried them, they haven't worked. We have to mm -hmm. document that in mm -hmm. order for my insurance company to pay. What is that about? So the term for that is step therapy. It's supposed to make it sound innocuous, like, oh, well, you have to, you know, try this step and then that step and then the other step. Essentially, if the insurance company doesn't want to pay, mm -hmm. then they'll make you jump through hoops. And the hoops might include try this one and fail it, try this one and fail it, try this one and fail it. Yeah. It is awful. 
I will say that in some cases, people have found that the patient assistance programs by the various drug companies can be very helpful. And the way you do that is you Google patient assistance program and the name of the medication to see whether you can qualify for what is essentially a subsidy from the drug company that will help you pay for it. There's a certain amount of moral hazard attached to that because essentially the insurance company theoretically will be paying its part. The drug company is subsidizing your medication and writing it off on their taxes. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. And, and saying, by the way, oh, we have these patient assistance programs to help people like Maura. Yeah. I always see the commercials for them. They're lovely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's a broken system, Maura. It's a broken system to which when I say that, people who've been inside the system for longer than I have say it's not broken. It's designed to work that way. Why? It's designed to extract money from you. Well, so last question, Jeannie. How do you know so much about this stuff? Tell us your origin story of clear health costs. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I worked at the New York Times for almost 25 years. I volunteered for a buyout in 2009. And a year to the day later, I won a Shark Tank type pitch contest to build a company telling people what stuff costs in healthcare. I did this because I joined a class in entrepreneurial journalism at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. I needed to have an idea for a business that had journalism DNA in it to join this class. Oh. And my idea was that I should be able to understand my healthcare bills. I've always been a careful consumer. It seemed obvious to me that I should be able to figure them out. I mean, I'm a smart person, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> come to find out, you know, the deeper I got into it, the more messy and convoluted and weird it became. And the more obvious it was to me that I need to keep doing this because nobody else is doing it. Mm -hmm. So come on over to clearhealthcost.com and take a look at our blog. We have a search engine for prices that you can find out that that MRI could be $300 or $6,000. Your colonoscopy could be $500 or $12,000. So to help you navigate in healthcare, and drop me a line, genie at clearhealthcost.com, if there's something I can help you out with. Jeannie, thank you so much. Thank you, Moret. While we've seen that ADHD is the most common condition to be treated with prescription stimulants, it's not the only one. Lindsay Scola is a writer, speaker, and nonprofit advisor. She works on Hollywood engagement meaning she works with celebrities and media properties to promote key social issues and raise awareness. And after experiencing often unexplained symptoms for years, Lindsay was diagnosed with narcolepsy at the age of 35. It was something that often interfered with her work, working with Barack Obama or on the Emmys. And when she got her diagnosis, she could finally manage all of her symptoms. Until the shortage began. Here's our conversation. So I reached out to you because we're part of an online community together, and you wrote a very impassioned missive to to our list because you were unable to get your Ritalin prescription. And so you asked for advice because stimulants are in very short supply. Can you tell us, you know, what led to the point of you sending out the email and asking for help? Yeah. So I take Ritalin for narcolepsy. I was diagnosed five years ago and there's no novel treatment for, for narcolepsy. So you take different medications, hoping that you can treat as many of the symptoms as possible. But because there's no novel treatment, it means that you might have to try quite a few medications to get uh, where you need to go. So at this point in five years, I'm on my 14th combination of medications. <laughs> and Ritalin is the thing that's worked the best for me in a very long time. You've probably heard about the Adderall shortage that got announced last year. And that started to roll into uh, Ritalin the first time I felt it 
was in January. My pharmacy told me they weren't going to be able to fill my prescription and had to call around to about 15 pharmacies until we found one that had it in stock. I got a two week prescription until my pharmacy was able to get it in stock. And then this last week, the pharmacy told me that they weren't going to have it in stock. They had no idea when it was going to come back. And I just started dialing pharmacies until I could find one that had it. I made somewhere in the realm of 70 phone calls uh, to different Seven pharmacies. Seven zero? Yeah. I have a I have a spreadsheet that shows 63 and I know I made more than that. So <laughs> it's it's somewhere somewhere in that realm and was looking for suggestions, help that anyone could give me. I had a friend with a doctor connection in Canada that was seeing if she could get me a prescription there. And my family lives in Seattle and they could drive to Vancouver, mm -hmm. was doing research to find out if we would be able to drive from LA down to Mexico to pick something up because I didn't know if I was going to be able to find anything. And, you know, don't, don't know what's going to happen next month. Eventually found a pharmacy that was able to order it for me. And I took my first dose in a week, uh, actually <sighs> three minutes before we got on the phone. Oh my God. Uh, can you feel it? I know Ritalin is a pretty fast acting. It's a pretty fast uh, medication and I'm, I'm feeling it come on more and more as we're talking. I'm feeling my brain start to kick in for the first time in quite a while. You know, if you miss an afternoon dosage or even one day, you can deal with that. But the problem with some of these medications is the longer you're off, the more the effects you start to feel. And uh, mm -hmm. as of yesterday, I was really starting to hurt in terms of hearing my own brain and functioning and being able to to do things for long enough without having to take a nap. Wow. Well, I think narcolepsy is something that all of us we sort of know what it is, but we probably don't really know what it is. I mean, I certainly didn't. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, I, I had no idea what it was until I got diagnosed. I probably had symptoms for close to 20 years before I was diagnosed and was really at my wits end by the time I, I finally got this diagnosis. And I was so desperate for answers. And I finally hear my doctor say, you have narcolepsy. And I sort of tilted my head and looked at him and said, I don't think you're right. I've never fallen asleep into a bowl of soup. Because the only <laughs> thing I knew about narcolepsy was that scene from Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, you know, the classic Hollywood movie, uh, <laughs> that, you know, the woman falls asleep into a bowl of soup. And uh, I I had never fallen asleep while I was talking or, you know, experienced anything like that. He very quickly let me know that that's not what narcolepsy is. But unfortunately, that's what most of us think it is. Yeah. So narcolepsy actually involves five key symptoms, excessive daytime sleepiness. This comes on as anything from after I wake up, I can have a good night's sleep and wake up feeling decently rested. And within 30 minutes, if I don't take medication, I can feel like I've been awake for 48 to 72 hours. It also comes across um, as something we'll call sleep attacks, uh, where out of nowhere, uh, exhaustion just consumes you. Uh, you feel sort of heavy from your eyelids to your toes, uh, like you've just been encapsulated in a weighted blanket. And uh, mm. I get this sensation that if I don't go to sleep right now, I'm going to die. Mm. Uh, fractured sleep, which is where you can fall asleep but have a hard time staying asleep and you can be awake for multiple hours during the night and not be able to go back to sleep. And then you finally do fall asleep. You have to wake up to live your life. Sleep paralysis, which anybody can have, but people with narcolepsy have much more frequently. And that's when uh, you usually feel like you're dreaming and you can't move, you can't talk. And that's, you're actually having the fourth symptom of narcolepsy, which is a, a hypnagogic hallucination, which are hallucinations when you're falling asleep or waking up or where you're seeing or hearing or sensing something uh, that isn't there. And that can feel like a night terror or, you know, a bad dream, but it's actually you're in between a sleep and wake situation. And then the last symptom, which some people with narcolepsy have and some people don't, is cataplexy. And that's when you feel a strong emotion, you have a loss of muscle tone. And that mm. can be anything from a droop in one eye to falling over like a, a marionette doll. I do have cataplexy. Uh, mine is very subtle and it happens in my face. So, you know, if I'm having an extreme emotion to something, you know, one lip can drop down or an eye can droop, but it, it mine is very subtle, fortunately. 
The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Can you give us a lay person's explanation, if you can, of what's happening in your nervous system in that sense? Narcolepsy is a disorder of the sleep-wake cycle. So your body gets confused between when it's supposed to be awake and when it's supposed to be asleep. So just like when you're in REM sleep and your body makes it so you can't move, so you don't act out your vivid dreams, your body is confused in this situation and thinks it's like that dream situation and is trying to keep it so you can't act out what's happening. Wow. It's trying to keep you safe so you don't sleepwalk out a window. Basically, it's a very similar function. So you said it it took you 20 years to get a diagnosis? Yeah. You know, the the biggest symptom for me over that time was excessive daytime sleepiness. And unfortunately, when you don't know what's wrong with you, you don't have a great vocabulary for what's happening. So for me, I just knew that I felt extremely tired and I didn't know that my tired was different from anybody else's tired. And the first conversation I remember having with my doctor, um, I was 16 and telling her that I was feeling really tired. I had done uh, summer school for junior statesman of America. It was very cool. I was in when junior I was in states. You were? Oh my, I was. <laughs> oh my God. We have so much to catch up on, 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 on JSA history. Uh, so I did the, the summer school at Yale for JSA and, um, was having these moments where I was in class and just feeling like I could not keep my eyes open. There was nothing I could do. I was fighting it. And definitely felt embarrassed by it. Wasn't going to lay my head down and go to sleep in this class and would go into the bathroom and take a nap and oh my told my doctor about this. And first it's like, well, teenagers can be tired. And like, well, and this seems really tired. And she knew that I had a lot of extracurriculars. I was played soccer. I was in theater, uh, in my senior year of high school, I was working for a nonprofit. Um, so I was busy <laughs> and she told me that busy people are tired and this is just something to sort of get used to. And so I didn't, I didn't realize that what I was experiencing was so drastically different from what everyone else was experiencing. And I didn't have any vocabulary to bridge that gap with my doctor. And I had these similar conversations with doctors, you know, as time went on, uh, so I worked in politics. Uh, I moved a lot um, when I was uh, in the Obama world between the administration and campaigns. Uh, I moved 11 times in 12 years. And, wow. you know, like a lot of other things, narcolepsy ebbs and flows. So there were times mm-hmm. where it was particularly bad and I would investigate with a doctor and wouldn't really get anywhere and then it would feel better and I would let it go. And then by the time it got bad again, I was in a different place and had a different doctor. So it was a lot of reliving the same situation over and over again without ever sort of moving towards an answer. And, you know, sort of an interesting thing with narcolepsy, and I've heard other people talk about this, is it really affects your memory. And so mm. there are times during this 20 year period that I can look back and remember who was sitting at a meeting table with me and what shoes I was wearing and how much I paid for them. And other times where there's months, seasons, years that I have no memories as though I am looking through a diary with blank pages. Wow. Wow. Does it affect your long-term memory only or short-term memory too? It definitely affects my short-term memory. When it's worse, uh, I, you know, I, there's definitely conversations with my significant other that I do not remember. Um, so I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's to his benefit. Um, but, uh, uh, no, it definitely does affect my, my short-term memory as well. I mean, this last week where I've been unmedicated, we were trying to set the table for dinner the other night and I went into the kitchen from the room next to it. Uh, and we live in a big open floor pan apartment. So you could see the kitchen from where I was going, uh, four times to get bread. Wow. I kept getting there and forgetting and walking back. And it took me four trips back into the kitchen to bring the bread to the table. It must have been so scary for you 
and also frustrating. I mean, I think you're highlighting something that happens a lot to people where they have something, you know, that's atypical and doctors just write it off, you know, and, and then you're in this space of, wait, am, am I crazy? Like what, what's happening? And it sounds like that happened a lot to you. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's a reason with sleep disorders why the diagnosis period is so long. You know, the average for narcolepsy is between seven and 15 years. You know, I sit at the 20 year mark and it's because you don't get all five of these symptoms at once. You don't know that those symptoms are connected. I never would have guessed that those symptoms were connected. You're not able to talk to your doctor in a way where they're like, oh, that's uh, you know, textbook narcolepsy. And doctors don't have a lot of sleep education. Depending on which study you read, it's, you know, somewhere between an hour and three hours of sleep education on average for American doctors. So they're not trained to pick up on this either. And, you know, so I did have doctors along the way that would pick up on something. You know, when I was 27, my mom and my sister came to stay with me in my very small studio apartment in New York. It was uh, 300 square feet and uh, had one of those bathrooms that was like the most efficient bathroom in America where the <laughs> toilet, the sink and the bathtub all touched each other. So, you know, you could you could get in and get out quickly. <laughs> but in 300 square feet, you can hear everything. So they both heard me talking in my sleep that night. And it wasn't like just like a mumbled sentence or maybe a few words. They could pick up that I was on a date. I was asking questions about my date. I was answering questions about myself. I have celiac disease and I turned down the bread basket. So it was particularly sad to everyone that even in my dreams, I can't eat gluten. And, you know, at this point, my mom was just hoping she didn't hear the end of the date. But uh, in the morning, everyone is like, okay, this is this is not normal. You, you need to see the doctor about this. So I go to see the doctor and the doctor's like, yeah, that doesn't sound normal. So she sent me for a sleep apnea test because it was the only thing that she knew to look for. And the sleep apnea test came back negative for sleep apnea. And I got sent on my way. And that was nine years before I got diagnosed when there were clearly some some weird things that were happening. And... It was this sort of repeated situation over and over again where some doctors were were really trying to help me and some doctors were just completely dismissive of and you know I'm I'm someone who really wants to get to the bottom of everything and naturally pushes back but there were moments where I was at my wits end with that and so I try to spend most of the time that I can making sure the next person doesn't go for 20 years that they understand that there are things that they too can push back on and and understanding that there's reasons that you can be tired that don't stem from a bad mattress or work or family stress. So when I finally did get diagnosed, I was in a particularly bad period. My fractured sleep was terrible. I was awake pretty much every night from 3 to 6 a.m. and then maybe fall asleep for 45 minutes before I had to get ready for work. I was having really bad sleep attacks. That's when when that if I don't go to sleep, I'm going to die period would come on. And I mm -hmm. was uh, sleeping in the bathroom at work where I worked at the time had a theater attached to it. And there were these like deep holes between the rows of seats on like the concrete floor that I felt like I could take a nap without anyone finding out. <gasps> and I was also having some pretty bad hallucinations at that point too. And I, I had no idea that they were hallucinations. I was like this period of time where I was being woken up by a small ghost child asking to hold my hand. Um, I thought I was haunted. Now, I lived in a like an old bungalow in Echo Park. So it was probably a yes and situation on the haunting. But my response was to go out and purchase sage, not that I was having a neurological episode. Uh, but I was just I was really beside myself and was pleading with my doctor for answers. So she sent me for another sleep apnea test. This was the at home test. Uh, it came back negative. I fueled by um, an entire pint of Ben and Jerry's uh, Cherry Garcia and a bottle of red wine. I found the end of the internet that night and found out that the at-home tests were designed to diagnose overweight middle-aged men uh, by the VA as a low-cost alternative. And I was like, all right, this is it. I'm not this. So there's still a chance that I might have sleep apnea. Uh, and I'm back in her office just pleading my case. And at this point, she acquiesced that we were beyond both of our education on sleep at this point and finally sent me to a sleep specialist. And I was diagnosed pretty soon after that. These things are just embedded in our systems. We don't even think about them. 
No. And the problem is, is that, you know, most doctors don't know to keep pushing on that. Mm. So the insurance pays for the at-home test first. And if that comes back negative, you can be sent on your way. Sometimes the at-home tests don't pick up specific types of apneas in in women um, and, you know, need tests beyond that for narcolepsy, it's a completely different test. You know, it's an all night sleep study where you're in the hospital like you would be for for sleep apnea, but then they wake you up at 6am and every two hours ask you to take uh, a 30 minute nap and they're judging how fast you fall asleep and if you fall into REM sleep. Uh, I know in in my exam, uh, my fastest nap happened in 59 seconds. Wow. Uh, but that's a completely, it's a completely different study than what my doctor was sending me for and then telling me that I was okay. I'm curious how you think your narcolepsy has impacted your career. I think when I was undiagnosed and there were moments where I had very little control over my emotions. I, I know I've been watching that sort of steadily get worse and worse as this last week has gone on. I think there are situations that I didn't handle as well as I could have. I'm highly sensitive, very quick to tears, I think, outside of narcolepsy and narcolepsy makes it worse. So I know there were situations where I was probably potentially passed up for things or looked over because because I know that I have this this knee jerk reaction. You know, I, I've had an incredible career regardless. I worked for the president of the United States and I, you know, I've done a lot of incredible things, but you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful to narcolepsy in the way that it's really gotten me to focus on myself and how I sort of live intentionally for what's going to be best for me. And so, you know, this, the last couple of years, it's been, how do I continue to have something that I work from home so I can nap when I need to and make sure that I'm doing things in in the way that's best for my body, um, which has, you know, led me to writing and speaking. And I'm really excited about what the future holds and how I'm able to talk with, with other people, specifically women, uh, to make sure that they're also caring for themselves. And that when you're doing everything to sort of intentionally operate in what's best for you and something still feels wrong, to know that there are things that that could be and how you find those answers. Hmm. You work for yourself. I do. I also work for myself. And for me, it was a real aha moment to realize that managing my mental ups and downs, my anxiety and my depressions and my up phases and my down phases was probably a big piece of the reason why I was an entrepreneur, because I couldn't show up and be at an office for 10 hours a day. And I'm curious if that resonates. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really think it does. I think Working in an office, especially in high paced, crazy environments like I did, I was in a hamster wheel. Mm. And I don't think I realized just sort of how much noise there was that was distracting me from from focusing on what I wanted to do. I think I just was, you just keep moving. When you're sort of in those environments, it's really hard to take a step back and say, you know, is this good for me? Is this good for my mental health? Is this what I want to be doing? And even when I got diagnosed with narcolepsy, I was just looking for that pill that made me me. And I'm an autoimmune collector. Some people collect Hummel figurines or cute sneakers. I I collect autoimmune conditions. So when I got diagnosed with hypothyroidism when I was 24, uh, I cried for a solid morning that I was going to have to take a pill every day for the rest of my life. And then I pretty quickly figured out that I take my Synthroid and I never have to think about my thyroid. And for the most part, that's been right. Uh, and then I got diagnosed with celiac in my late twenties and outside of an epic meltdown on the phone with my mom that I was never going to eat my own wedding cake, uh, to which at the time oh. she was far more concerned I was going to find someone to marry. And she let me cry that one out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I found a gluten-free bakery that afternoon. And I pretty quickly found out that as long as I don't put gluten in my system, I don't have to think about celiac. So when I was looking for this pill that was going to make me me again, 
and I didn't find it. You find out with narcolepsy, you don't get better. You just get better at having narcolepsy. And for me, part of that meant, okay, how do I get off the hamster wheel? How do I stop taking all of my narcolepsy medications for a quick moment so that I can figure out what my baseline is, what I'm feeling. So then when I go forward, I can know if what I'm feeling is a narcolepsy symptom or a side effect of a medication. Um, and that I can be more intentional in this. And well, meditation and exercise and some of those other things I do are not replacements for medication. How are those helping me feel better, feel less stressed? When I have a regular meditation practice, I definitely have less sleep paralysis. And, you know, how does all of this play together for me? And I think if I hadn't had the moment of working for myself and pacing myself for what was going to be best to figure that out, I never would have gotten there. And I never would have given myself the the opportunity to realize that I really do enjoy public speaking and I really do enjoy writing. And how do I do more of that? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that in that way that it's really taught me how to do all of this in a way that my body and my mind are going to be happier. And then when did you find Ritalin? Uh, I started taking Ritalin about seven months ago. Oh, so recent. Yeah. No, I mean, in five years, I'm on my 14th combination medication. I've tried <gasps> a lot of things because there's no, there's, there's nothing novel. And so what's going to work really well for someone with narcolepsy sitting next to me might not work for me. And then also because none of these drugs are solving the issue that creates the narcolepsy, something can work really great for four months and then stop working altogether. I was really happy on a different drug for a little while. And I said to my doctor, like, this is going really well, but I don't think it's my forever drug. And he was like, of course, none of this is your forever drug. Like, (laughs) you're going to have to change at some point, regardless of what it is. So I started taking Ritalin about seven months ago, and it's been game changing for me in a lot of ways. It's been it's been really good in terms of just consistent energy and focus and uh, don't have some of the the crashes that I've had on other medications, which, you know, someone else's experience could be absolutely different. But for me, this has been the thing that's worked the best for me. And something that's been particularly frustrating as this has continued in terms of the shortage is that, you know, a pharmacist will say, well, just have your doctor put you on something else. And it's not a one for one. I can't just start taking a different drug tomorrow and have the same response to it. So every time I switch drugs, there's a period where you know, life's just not going to be great for a little while. Most of these drugs you have to titrate up on. You can't just start taking the same dose that you were on. You have to see if your body's going to respond to it. You have to see if you're going to have side effects to it. I'm particularly sensitive. I seem to have, you know, more side effects than not. And definitely as the shortage has gone on, I've been on multiple generics and every generic from every manufacturer is completely different and have had to, you know, navigate the ups and downs on that. The whole thing's been very frustrating. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And that brings us back full circle to the shortage. What are you thinking about? What's 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 your plan? Um I don't I can't sit here and tell you I have a great plan right now. Uh this week I was grateful to find my medication. I'm hoping that this pharmacy will be able to find it next month. Um, but that's in the back of your mind of like what happens next month. Stimulants are already not like a super easy process when they're in stock. You have to get a brand new prescription every month. You can't pick it up until the end of your previous prescription. So, you know, in this case, I wasn't able to find out that my pharmacy didn't have the medication and hadn't been getting it until the very last minute. And so, you know, you're going into a panic situation of, oh my God, I'm not going to have medication because I think I found out three days before I ran out. I need to find something. And then also a feeling at the same time of like, okay, if I find something, what happens next month? So, uh, you know, for me, I'm looking at, do I switch medications at some point? So I don't have to go through this. I really don't want to do that. Um, but this is where we're at right now. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping if we can make enough noise about this, we can start figuring out um, how, how there can be some change in the situation. Cause it's not just affecting people with narcolepsy and ADHD, but, you know, hundreds of different disorders that people who take these medications and, you know, personally trying to use my voice on this to remind people because some of the news coverage 
has really talked about it as like a short disruption for people. But these are these are life saving drugs. Uh, these are this is not something cushy that makes your life a little bit better when you have a disorder. These are these are life saving drugs, and I'm very fortunate that you know my job is sitting at a desk on my computer and the occasional phone call. But you know if you're if you're someone that needs to show up as a, a doctor or a police officer or, or, you know, works retail or, or someplace where you have to be there and you have to get there and you have to drive a car and all of these things. If you don't have this medication, you don't have it consistently. Uh, how, how do you survive? And, you know, I've, I lost a week of my life, whether it was dialing pharmacies or napping more than I usually do or just not being able to have my brain work in the way that I needed it to. And, you know, not, not everybody has the ability to do that with their jobs. And so this is a really dangerous situation that we're in. Wow. Well, Lindsay, we will try to amplify. And uh, thank you for, thank you for your story. Thank you. That's it for today. Our show is produced and edited by Mary Dew. Our assistant producer and sound engineer is Nick Krinko. Many thanks to the LinkedIn Presents family and to all our guests for sharing their stories. If you love the show, tell your friends. I would love you to leave a review because they really matter in helping the show get found. You could also follow us or subscribe. If you have a question for me or you want to submit an idea for the show, find me on LinkedIn where you can follow me, message me, I promise I'll write back, or subscribe to my newsletter for more from the anxious achiever world. Thanks for listening.